Hey there, Rooted family. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Jono Tedder, and I have the privilege of navigating us through today's digital gathering. At Rooted Fellowship, we say that we're about three things. We are gospel-centered, we are disciple-making, and we are transcultural. We also strive to be known as a generous church. And so for more information on some of the three things that I've just shared, or for the ways in which you can give to the Lord's work at Rooted Fellowship, head on over to our website, rootedfellowship.com. At this time, we are also aware that there may be many people in our family struggling. And so if you have a financial need or, or someone to pray for you or any kind of need at this time, please do reach out to us at community at rootedfellowship.com. At this moment, I'd like us to head on over and worship God in song. currently in the third season of Mark's Gospel. And today we have the privilege of Elder Kenny Mitozzi taking us through the remainder of Mark chapter 10. And so let's head on over and hear God's word. Good morning. And whatever time uh, you're watching this, uh, say hello from me. My name is Kenny Matozi, and um, one of the privileges I have here is serving as uh, one of the elders. Uh, but one of the privileges I have this morning is being able to share God's word uh, this morning. So if you were with us last week, you would know that we are in, we back in Mark. Uh, it's been uh, just a couple of weeks, and uh, Pastor Jonah last week uh, took us through various aspects of what it, 
what the upside down kingdom of Jesus Christ looks like when we think about marriage, divorce, when you think about uh, children, when you think about money. Um, it was quite a good breakdown. And so as we get into our text this morning, as we continue with uh, season three, uh, what we're going to see is that we are edging closer and closer to the climax, which makes sense because uh, this effectively becomes uh, the time where Jesus is approaching uh, his last week um, on earth. Um, and so basically, uh, what we see is that uh, Jesus ups the ante. Um, he's sensing the times, uh, he ups the ante, and he's anticipating what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And so he goes hard on aspects of his uh, kingship, his kingdom, what it looks like, uh, what it is, what it isn't. Um, power dynamics, authority in his kingdom. And although a lot of it is repetition, uh, his disciples and followers, for some reason, still don't get it. And so today's text finds us in Mark 10, verse 32 to uh, 52. But before we get into the text, before we read the text, um, uh, let's close our eyes and let's pray. I would ask that you also pray for me um, in this time. Let's close our eyes. Dear Lord, we we are thankful that you are you are a good God. You are a gracious God. You are Lord of Lords. Uh, you are the King of Kings. Um, you are the ultimate. Uh, uh, we have never experienced anything like you, Lord, and we never will. And so even as we uh, pour ourselves into the scriptures, Lord, I pray that uh, you may open up our hearts. Um, you may open up our hearts to uh, a truth that transcends our lived experiences, a truth that transcends anything we've ever seen, uh, anything that we've ever experienced, Lord Jesus. And so uh, prayer for, for this message for today is that uh, I would shrink away. I would just be a vessel uh, that you would use me, Lord, uh, to speak that which is true, uh, that which you want your people uh, to hear, Lord. Uh, and praying that we may all uh, listen to this with holy ears, with a holy tongue, Lord, that we may taste that you are good, you are gracious, that uh, what you bring to us is a is an unbelievable unbelievable treasure um, uh, whose worth could have, could all never be imagined, Lord. So, Lord, uh, be with us as we go through this word. Um, inspire us, uh, remind us of how different what you bring is, Lord. And so, Lord, all of this we pray in your holy name. Amen and amen and amen. So. Um, if you have a Bible, if you have a device, uh, let's turn to uh, Mark 10, uh, verses 32 to uh, 34. And so uh, from the onset, uh, Jesus, um, Jesus foretells his death for the third time. And this is how it reads. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he became, began to tell them what was, hap what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days, and after three days, he will rise. And so, at this at this point at this point of the scriptures, um, Mark pretty, pretty much tells us that they were on their way to Jerusalem. They being uh, Jesus' disciples and his followers. And so, what Mark does is he paints this this picture, this portrait of a lonely Jesus who who's ahead of the crowd, who's ahead of everyone. Uh, this is Jesus, the forerunner. Jesus. Uh, the great shepherd, um, Jesus, the great leader. And he tells us that the followers were, were amazed and uh, they were in fear. And so what we find is that if we go look at other gospel accounts, um, what preceded uh, this journey into Jerusalem uh, was basically the, the raising of Lazarus. And so with Lazarus, after this happens, uh, the chief priests, the scribes, the teachers, start to pretty much plot to kill Jesus, uh, precipitated by the raising of Lazarus. 
And we see also in Mark 9 that Jesus, Mark 9 verses uh, 32, 32, Jesus actually tells uh, his disciples that he's going to get killed. So I can only speculate that uh, the disciples, uh, the followers, being amazed at this, they are probably amazed at uh, this man has continuously told us that he's going to get killed, and yet he's still going to the very place where he's going to be killed. All right. And so I imagine even the fear was maybe fear for Jesus that this might actually happen, but also maybe fear for their own lives, uh, that they've been uh, they're associated with Jesus. And so whatever dread whatever uh, tragedy is going to befall Jesus might also befall them. And so once again, which is the third time now, uh, Jesus uh, reminds the twelfth of his death. The last time he mentioned in chapter 9 verses 32, uh, it states that uh, they did not understand and they were afraid to ask him. And I can tell you that based on the next few chapters, that it almost feels like we're back to the same page. They still don't understand it, right? And when we look at this, I imagine for the disciples, it's mostly due to the fact that their idea of a victorious king uh, was based on a victorious king who conquers through bloodshed and death. And yet here is this victorious king um, whose victory is going to come by uh, his bloodshed and his death, and he conquers death, and he conquers death um, for the sake of his enemies. I can almost imagine this, this whole idea that Jesus brings, this upside-down kingdom, uh, where he does not shed blood, but his blood is shed. It was very new to them. They had no framework for this. It was almost... It was almost like asking the disciples to think of a new color and describe the taste of it. They had no framework for this. And so this morning, as we go through uh, the rest uh, of this chapter, verses 35 to 32, what we're going to see is that Jesus will emphasize uh, various aspects of his kingdom, right? This upside down kingdom. And I'm going to break it down into four parts, right? Where Jesus... Uh, tells us of this, or oh, he displays to us uh, this unique kingdom, um, a unique leadership, uh, a unique people, and a unique king. So the first point, a unique kingdom. Let's read verses 35 to 41, which reads, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we asked for you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with, the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they, became, they began to be indignant at James and John. And so I have to, I have to confess that I've, I've often read this uh, request of James and John from the perspective of someone uh, that has read the whole Bible. And so if we know anything about um, the life of James and John post-Jesus, um, they, they had really remarkable lives. John, James was actually the first martyr, dreadful death. Um, John, on the other hand, he lives a very, very long life, uh, but not a, a life free of persecution. He experiences persecution right till the end. So when I frame uh, this, this request, to me, there's almost a sense of innocence in it, um, ambition, and it's almost adm admirable. But the truth of the matter is, contextually, at that point in time, 
uh, James and John had in their mind something different. They had in their mind Christ coming in, the, in, in his glory in the form of an earthly kingdom, um, another empire uh, that would dismantle the then existing Roman Empire. So in their request to sit at the right and left of Jesus Christ, uh, what James and John are actually doing is they're lining themselves themselves up for uh, positions of authority and of power. They're lining themselves up to rule and to reign over others. If Jesus was the CEO, uh, they were essentially saying, Jesus, we want the COO position and the CFO position. And so their idea of a functioning kingdom was rooted in their lived experience of a social construct of an honor and shame culture, uh, which was very strong in the ancient world. And so what Rome had managed to do as an empire was to really build up this this massive system of inequality. This was a system, uh, a culture where you saw the 3% um, had all the political, uh, political power, they had all the wealth. Right. This wasn't even a pyramid structure. This was a line that goes like this, and then um, it branches off. So those were the 3%. They had all the wealth. They had all the political power. And then the other 85%, these were the working class, uh, the working lower class, actually. Uh, these were the working poor. And this gets worse because further below them were what you might call the expendables, the ones that did not have any value, the ones that did not matter, the ones that did not bring a skill. These were often widows, this were, these were orphans, these were the disabled, these were beggars. So if you were not born high up in this structure, your fate was sealed. Your fate was sealed unless someone came and said, Um, they're establishing a new kingdom. And this was almost a new opportunity to get yourself up up the structures. And so when we look at uh, James and John and probably the disciples, their whole worldview of a successful kingdom was framed by conquest after conquest after conquest. This was their history. This is what they knew. And they were always on the bad side of it and so for them the one who conquers is the one who receives the honor the one who is conquered is reduced the margins of society reduced to subhuman status no voice and only shame to their name so one would say to some degree it makes sense that they hadn't been able to divorce themselves from this idea of a successful kingdom. And so this makes sense because this is a kingdom that shouts that if if you have honor, you have value. If you have value, you have a voice, you have power, you have influence, you can define things for yourself. Right? And in all honesty, or your name might even be etched into history. And I mean, who would not want that? So when we look at Jesus, he gives this very, very fascinating response in verses 38 to 41, where what he basically says is that um, you do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and to be baptized uh, with the baptism from which I'm baptized? And so very briefly, uh, the cup and the baptism that Jesus speaks of, in terms of the baptism, uh, if we look at Luke 12, verses 50, it says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it's accomplished. And now where Jesus mentions the cup, he actually mentions it several times in Mark, but in all other gospel accounts, he also mentions it, but most notably in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he asked of God the Father to take this cup away. And so when we rewind back in the Old Testament, we find this this phrase, drinking of God's cup or drinking of the cup of God's wrath. 
We see this in Jeremiah 25, 15, which reads, uh, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take this cup of the wine of the wrath from my hand and make all the nations to whom I'm sending you drink from it. And so at a basic level, the context of this verse is that once again, God's people have rebelled. God's people have turned away from him. And so as a form of judgment, God says, I will allow foreign nations to actually conquer you. But what we also need to understand is that um, when God sends this judgment, it's not just punitive in nature, but it's also meant to achieve restoration for Israel. And so with this in mind, when Jesus speaks about drinking of the cup, when he speaks about the baptism, what he's saying is that he's going to allow himself to be conquered by the scribes, by the teachers, by the Pharisees, and by the Roman Empire. So Jesus' kingdom is very unique. It isn't one that usurps authority. It isn't one that overpowers, overthrows. But his kingdom is a kingdom um, that is marked by servitude, self-control, denial, and self-sacrifice. I love what John says here, the words of Jesus in John uh, 18 verses 36. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my time is, but my kingdom is not from this world. So we understand that Jesus' kingdom is, it's different. It's unique. And so for most of us, I think most of us can relate to this. Uh, we can, we can feel that we're in moments where we feel conquered by life, by various structures in life. We feel like we're not winning. And so while times have changed, uh, many of us may fall into the same pitfalls as the disciples. And so the capitalistic machine says, get as much as you can at whatever cost. It says uh, the more success uh, accumulation, the more you are esteemed, the more you are valued, the more you are content, the more, the more, the more, the more, the more. And you just keep getting more and more and more and more. And maybe you have been faithful, you have been obedient, you've been work, walking this journey, uh, this Christian walk um, obediently. You've been walking it well and you still feel stuck. You still feel like you're not going anywhere. And when you cast your eyes across the room, um, those people who've got a reckless disregard for God or they're indifferent to God, the people that don't care, the people that are self-promoting, self-serving, um, the people that are selfish, they seem to be progressing. They seem to be making all the difference. They seem to be the ones who are getting all the honor and all the accolades. And you may be feeling the temptation to throw the towel in. You may be feeling the temptation to use the tools of the world to get ahead, to enter the red race and make your name known, to build your own little kingdom, to build your own little statue where people are going to acknowledge you. You know, what I can tell you is that using the tools of this world ends in destruction. And using the tools of the world only results in strife, in rivalry, and in broken relationships. And we can even see in verses 41 where um, Mark says that upon, basically upon hearing the request of James and John, um, the other disciples are not too happy about it. Right? Basically, they were annoyed and they were displeased. And there could have been good reasons or bad reasons. It almost feels like James and John are putting themselves up in positions of authority to rule over them. And maybe they wanted those positions. So as you move on, point number two, we see a unique leadership. Um, and so Jesus proceeds to contrast ideologies of the kingdoms of this world versus his kingdom and basically how they deal with power and authority. And for that, we'll be reading uh, verses 42 to 45. 
verses 42. And Jesus called them to, to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be, shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what Jesus points uh, paints here is basically uh, this world where people misuse their authority, they misuse their, their power. And so for most of you, you are thinking, well, this wasn't a problem in the ancient world, it's still a problem now, and this is very true. And so the portrait is basically of how humans deal with power and authority. The Roman Empire at its height was very brutal. Basically, they used their power and authority for subjugation, for self-gratification, uh, for self-promoting means. Um, they used it as a reign of terror. And so some of you might be saying, uh, my boss sounds like, that sounds like my boss. And so one of the things that I love about Jesus here is that he's not saying that there's something wrong with positions of power and authority. And I think that is why he actually never dismisses the request of James and John. And so what Jesus does, actually, he redefines um, what his kingdom leadership looks like. And so his kingdom is where those, his kingdom leadership is where those considered great and first, are the ones at the forefront of humility, servitude, and elevation of others. This is a leadership so unique that uh, you assume the role of a servant. You put yourself in the back, in the back row. You devote yourself to another and you treat the other uh, the other people's interest is primary. And so what Jesus does is, after dropping this, this bombshell, uh, he goes on further uh, to use himself as a role model, as the one that occupies the highest possible seat uh, in eternity as king over the universe. And he says that even in that capacity, when he comes down, he doesn't come down to be king, to be first and foremost, but instead he comes down to serve. And he even assumed this role of a servant to the point of death. As we move on, point three, uh, point four, uh, these I'm going to put together, but basically this is a unique people and a unique king. And as we reach the end, uh, we get a glimpse of how uh, Jesus uh, actually engages uh, with a blind beggar. And for this, we'll be reading verses 46 to 52. Verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as, well, as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and the great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. So what we get here is an account of a blind beggar. And so Matthew, on the other hand, his account presents us with uh, two blind beggars. But for some reason, Mark, on the other hand, focuses on just the one, on the one blind beggar. And so how Mark focuses on him is quite remarkable. 
And so what Mark does, he tells us um, who he was, uh, what he was, and where he was. Uh, who he was, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. What he was, he was a blind beggar. Where he was, he was on the side of the road. And so in the ancient world, if you were born blind, your societal standing was already predetermined. Basically, what this said about you was uh, you were a sinner or you were cursed uh, or you were being punished by God. And this is seen evidently uh, in John 9 verses 1 where Jesus is about to perform another healing uh, of a man born blind and his disciples ask Jesus, uh, this man was born blind. Who sinned? Uh, was it him or was, his, what, was it his parents? And so people would look at you being born blind and the first assumption is that you're a sinner or you're cursed or you're being punished by God. And basically the, the, uh, the outcome was of this was that you were a social outcast and more than likely you would end up a beggar. And if you remember a couple of minutes ago, um, in the hierarchy back in the day, the people that were at the bottom, 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 the ones that were expendable, it was the disabled, it was the beggars. Now imagine, imagine you are disabled and you're a beggar. How far down the pecking order are you? And so for Bartimaeus, he was pretty much relegated to the margins of society without a voice. And so for some reason, in Mark, Bartimaeus is the only person that Jesus has healed that Mark actually names. And so there are many theories to this as to why did uh, Mark get into the details of who this was. Some theories are that um, he was a follower. It was a historical, historical account. He was probably there in the upper room later on. And so this is just one of those things where someone reads this and says, oh, I remember that guy. This is how he was saved. And so whatever the speculation is, for me, what, what Mark does so skillfully is that he takes someone that society does not care about. He takes someone that has been relegated to the margins of society. And he, just by bringing up his name, by mentioning him, he, he makes him part of the greatest story ever told. He weaves him into this tapestry that is amazing of the story of Jesus Christ, the story of salvation. And what we're going to see in a couple of verses that what, what Mark has done is just a reflection of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the upside down kingdom. So let's have a better look at Jesus' exchange with Bartimaeus. So Bartimaeus refers to Jesus Christ as the son of David. The title son of David, although it spoke of Jesus' gene genealogy, basically who he came from, um, it meant more than that. It was a title for the long-awaited savior, the long-awaited deliverer the one who would fulfill the Old Testament prophecies, the one who was the Messiah King. This is the one that they were all waiting for. So what we get here is that when Jesus responds to this title, he uses this opportunity to once again reaffirm that not only is he the long-awaited Messiah, but he's the servant king. So I've never experienced this, but I always see it in the movies. So I'm going to assume maybe someone has experienced it or it's true, but uh, often there'll be a commotion, there'll be an emergency, and someone just screams, is there a doctor in here? Is there a doctor in here? And sometimes there is a doctor, and so the doctor says, I'm a doctor, how can I help, right? And we say that something's happened to this person we don't know. So the person that responds by saying, I'm a doctor, they assume the role of a doctor. They display that they're a doctor, either by doing CPR or taking out some tools or whatever it is that doctors do. But at that point in time, it's quite clear that this is not a fraud. This is a life and death situation. 
they're assuming the title, the title of doctor and they're doing what a doctor does. And so Jesus does exactly this. He responds to the call of his title. He doesn't just leave it there. He puts on display that he is the servant king. He's the long-awaited Messiah. His kingdom is the upside-down kingdom. And so in verse 51, Jesus asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And this, this is such a loaded question for several reasons, but when you take it into its context, this is almost like Jesus saying, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? Right? And if you imagine every other aspect of the Caesars back then, the people in authority, they're not about to, first and foremost, assume the same space as a blind beggar. And for sure, they're not about to say, how can I serve you? And so what we see is that this is a king that leads with a posture of servitude and self-denial. And if, if James and John were on the background at this point in time, uh, they're probably kicking themselves, right? Because this is this very question that Jesus asked Bartimaeus is actually the very same question that Jesus asked James and John a couple of verses ago. And so what we see is that James and John pretty much respond uh, with where their hearts are. They were more pre preoccupied with positions of power, authority, and honor. And this was what was reflected in their answers. And so had James and John understood who Jesus really was and the kingdom that he brings and the nature of the kingdom that he brings, instead they would have said, Jesus, what we want is for you to open up our eyes, recover our sight, so that we may see you for who you are. And so Jesus heals Bartimaeus. And once again, he shows us that he's got dominion over sickness, he's got dominion over disability, but more than that, he has got the power to save. So in these very simple words, your faith has made you well. This made you well transcends a good health, a heartbeat. Um, it transcends um, what is happening in our body. But this is about what's happening to our souls, our standing with God. That's so when Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Uh, other translations would say that um, your faith has saved you or your faith has made you whole. And so this speaks of something bigger. And so what Jesus is saying, Bartimaeus, you are saved. And so when we look at Jesus' kingdom, his kingdom is for them. It's for the maligned. It's, it's for the social outcasts. It's for the ones that have been reduced to the margins of society. It's for the ones uh, that no, have no voice. Those who have been deemed lost uh, in society. Those who are at the right at the bottom. And so this king of ours has time to reach out to this guy on the side of the road. And so when Barameis cried out for Jesus, people shushed him. They even rebuked him. And so brothers and sisters, man, may, may, may we not be those kind of Christians. May we not be uh, the Christians that act as gatekeepers, the, the Christians that are not drawing people closer to Jesus, but we find means and ways to actually keep people away from Jesus, as if Jesus does not have time, as if Jesus is too busy, as if Jesus um, has got a schedule that is filled up. And so maybe we need to pray to God. We need to pray to God that he may search our hearts. But maybe this is something that we need to repent of, that unintentionally, maybe this is something that we're doing. And so as we land the plane, uh, there are many lessons here. The simplest and maybe the most obvious is that uh, pride, self-absorption, 
and a self-serving attitude will blind us from seeing Jesus for who he really is. We need to assume a posture of humility like Bartimaeus and realize that in truth, we are all like desperate beggars on the side of the road and we have no hope and no future. And so if we see Jesus as a networking tool, as what can I get from Jesus? We approach Jesus and we will be saying, what can you do for us? Instead of asking the question of, what has he done for me? And what Jesus has done, he's made a way for those who were, who were not seeking him in the first place. And those who were, that were indifferent to him, those who, those who were rebels against him. He has pursued them and reunited them to God through his perfect life, sacrificial death, and subsequent resurrection. And the less obvious lesson here is sometimes we can miss the person of Jesus. And this may be because we've got strange and biblical ideas of who Jesus Christ is. Or maybe the Jesus of our imagination is is a trendy Jesus that moves with the times. And in both instances, the danger is that we end up being dim lights instead of a bright shining lighthouse to guide lost people to a shore of Jesus' salvation. People will look at us and literally think there is no difference between these Christians and the world. If there's any difference, it's maybe what they do on Sundays and that they pray before they eat. But more than that, there is no difference. And so my prayer, um, not just not just for you, but for me as well, is that Jesus may open up our eyes and we may see him, experience him in the way that uh, he has been revealed in his true nature so that we may be the kind of followers that shine his light into a dark world that is desperate for a savior. Let us pray. Lord, um, you are you are the bright shining light, Lord. You, uh, you are the one that we strive for. You're the one that we need in life, Lord. Outside of you, our lives are darkness. Outside of you, Lord, um, we are trying to destroy each other. Outside of you, Lord, uh, we are self-promoting, we are selfish. And we are thankful, Lord, that even before um, our hearts were aligned to you. You cared for us. You died on the cross for us. And that you ransomed us, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that once again you may anchor us in this, Lord. That whatever is within, Lord, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit may convict us of just some of the things um, that we're very casual about. That means that we may shine your light, Lord, wherever we are, in whatever space that we're in that we may make you known with our every action, Lord. And even our non-action may make you known, Lord Jesus. I pray against hypocrisy, Lord. I pray against the spirit of um, a rivalry as well, Lord, that all of us may strive to be lower than the other, that we may strive uh, to serve one another, that we may be known as a humble and a gentle people, Lord, and that those that witness this may not speak of us highly, but they may speak of you highly. Who is this God that they serve? Who is this Jesus that has Jesus that has so changed their lives? And so I pray that you lead us, you guide us. And as you reminded the disciples of many of your lessons many times, we've we've got we have got forgetful hearts. I pray that you may continue to remind us when we stray, Lord. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, uh, etch uh, your words into our hearts so that we may never forget them, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much and have a good Sunday. We've come to the end of our digital gathering and we pray that you've been comforted, that you've been challenged and that you've been blessed. Don't forget to like, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell for more information on when we post our latest videos. We end all our gatherings with the benediction, which is a good word. And today's benediction comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 22.
The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Amen and amen. Have a blessed week, family.